It's Tuesday, September 8th, and this is now on HNN. Our national response to this pandemic has not been stellar on so many different levels. The biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world are making a historic pledge, vowing to not release the COVID-19 vaccine until it's proven safe. Here at home, the Education Department reports three coronavirus cases at a Kalihi school in the past week. We really need rent relief. Following two shutdowns, small businesses in Chinatown look for ways to stay afloat. And then all of a sudden they tell us, oh, we're pushing it back another month. We have power lines down everywhere. We have trees down everywhere. Out of control wildfires continue to tear through parts of California. I'm Chris Martinez with how the weather is making this fight all the more difficult. These stories, plus a pop-up mojito bar at Waimea Bay draws crowds and criticism coming up on This Is Now. Good afternoon. Thank you for watching This Is Now. I'm Jonathan, your director and producer, alongside Ashley. We want to get started with the latest numbers from the State Department of Health. Hey everyone, health officials say two more patients with COVID-19 have died, bringing Hawaii's death toll to 88. DOH is also reporting 66 new cases today. The breakdown by county shows 58 are on Oahu, six are on the Big Island, and two are on Maui. Wanted to make sure you knew that there is a 1 p.m. press conference with Mayor Caldwell coming up. We expect him to announce if there will be a extension of that stay at home order for Oahu. And then that's going to be followed up by a press briefing from Governor Ige at 2 p.m. Both will be on our agent and digital platforms. So stay with us. We'll send a push alert as soon as they are about to get started. And free surge testing continues on Oahu. The multi-agency effort starts at Aloha Stadium today through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Final testing at the stadium will be held on Monday. You're encouraged to pre-register at www.doineed covid19test.com. However, walk-ins and retakes are welcomed. Meanwhile, a major development in the race to produce a vaccine, some of the world's most well-known drug makers are presenting a united front, saying they will not rush out a vaccine without proper testing. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has the details. The race to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, now powered by an unprecedented joint pledge. This morning, the CEOs of nine pharmaceutical companies, including AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and Pfizer, say they will commit to high ethical standards and sound scientific principles as they work toward developing a vaccine. The statement includes a pledge to always make the safety and well-being of vaccinated individuals our top priority and to only submit a vaccine for approval or emergency authorization after demonstrating safety and efficacy through a phase three clinical study that is designed and conducted to meet requirements of expert regulatory authorities. The hope that this pledge will ensure public confidence in the process and confidence could be faltering. A USA Today poll of voters found two thirds say they won't get a coronavirus vaccine as soon as it comes out. One in four say they don't want to ever get it. While in a controversial move last week, the CDC asked states to prepare for a large-scale distribution of a coronavirus vaccine by November 1st, two days before the election. Part of what the administration has dubbed Operation Warp Speed to make sure a vaccine is approved and reaches as many people as quickly as possible. The president has repeatedly suggested a vaccine could be ready by this fall. This could have taken two or three years, and instead it's going to be... <laughs> going to be done in a very short period of time. Could even have it during the month of October. Others have tempered those expectations. Dr. Anthony Fauci predicting approval would come by the end of the year. Is it possible that it could be before then? And the answer is yes. I think it's unlikely, but I think it's possible. There are currently nine phase three trials underway, three of them here in the United States. Thousands of people have volunteered. Some get the placebo, some get the vaccine. The FDA says for a vaccine to be proven effective, at least 50% of the people who receive it have to be protected. For NBC News, I'm Stephanie Gosk. We've learned that the use of a Waikiki hotel to quarantine people will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in federal recovery funds. Keep in mind, that cost is each month. 
The bill could run into the millions of dollars for the partnership between the 130-room Pearl Hotel Waikiki and the State Department of Health, which manages the hotel quarantine and isolation program, according to the Star Advertiser. The 30-day contract cost the city nearly $380,000 for exclusive use of the hotel and includes a minimum of four hotel workers to support the health department. Now the city will pay for this hotel from the nearly $400 million allotted by the federal government under the Coronavirus Recovery Program. The city's contract with the hotel equals about $97 per night per room, whether the space is occupied or not. This hotel program is to provide a free stay for individuals who must quarantine due to COVID-19 exposure. Now the report says, these rooms are not for those visitors who were found upon arrival to lack appropriate quarantine accommodations. The DOE says one student and two employees at Dole Middle School have tested positive for the virus. Billy V is in Kalihi with more. Thank you very much. And new in this developing story is that there are now two cases that the Department of Education and the Department of Health are investigating to see if they are indeed positive for coronavirus. Let's go ahead and give you a look here. This is Dole Middle School here in the heart of Kalihi. Usually uh, this would be busy, but they are all on virtual learning. And then there are still a few students who are receiving specialized in-person services. They have been told also to stay home until at least Thursday. Instructional support is being provided by the school. So due to the timing and location on campus of the individuals, the employees that they are investigating, they say, the Department of Education, that the cases appear to not be connected. However, they are conducting an ongoing investigation to see if those cases are positive. Once they found out there's a possibility that the employees might be infected, they immediately quarantined them and they also cleaned uh, the areas where those employees were working. So they did with, with the rest, regular custodial staff and then the usual deep cleaning that they do when they find out that there is coronavirus in the area or there's the possibility. So once again, the investigation continues with the Department of Education and the Department of Health for two employees here at Dole Middle School. From Kalihi, I'm Billy V for This Is Now. Citing a drop in cases, Iolani School will welcome students back to campus in phases starting September 21st. All students will return by the 25th for a full day of in-person instruction. Iolani says along with social distancing measures, students and teachers will wear special face shields and masks. It's certainly no stretch to say the pandemic has caused an economic crisis and local businesses have been hit especially hard. We got Casey Lund in Chinatown today checking in on some of the local shops and restaurants to see how they're staying afloat. Our first stop was Valia Honolulu, a cute little boutique on Bethel Street that has a lot of locally designed clothes and cute little Hawaii knickknacks and gift ideas. Camille Hearn, the owner, opened it four years ago, and she says this is by far her most challenging year of business. I definitely did not imagine this would be something that would happen. Have you considered closing your doors for good during this? You know, I think for a lot of small businesses, it's crossed their mind because you have bills piling up and you're not really sure what's going to happen in the future. We really need rent relief. I think that, you know, we've been trying really hard to get relief on our own from the government, applying for what we can but we really need our landlords or the, or the city just to do a little bit more because rent relief in, the term, in terms of rent forgiveness is what we really need. Just a block away at Ali'i Coffee, owner James Webb says he's grateful to be open for takeout and thanks his loyal customers for keeping his business afloat. But just before the pandemic in late February, Ali'i Coffee had secured a second location in Waikiki, which now resembles a ghost town. We started to build it out and the, this whole pandemic hit and it was difficult trying to build out the space in Waikiki and seeing just the whole everything shut down before my eyes. It's been super difficult because they keep on saying they're going to open up and bring everybody in so we start to hire people you know to for Waikiki and then all of a sudden they tell us oh we're pushing it back another month. And businesses in Chinatown aren't just grappling with the dire economic situation. All the businesses that we talk to today say with less people on the streets shopping and eating, there's more opportunity for crime. And the homeless problem has gotten worse. 
This cracked window showed up just three days ago here at Smith & King's restaurant. Without any of us business owners present during our normal hours, it feels like we're not around to watch our businesses. Um, you know, typically we're around 12 hours a day watching the neighborhood, uh, making sure, you know, our streets are safer. Um, right now, on a Friday night, given I'm the only one open, um, it's scary out here. I won't walk my dogs late at night. I won't come out late at night. Um, there's very little to no police presence unless you're calling them. Owner Samantha Moore has been working to give her employees as many hours as possible just to retain them for when she is able to resume dine-in services. We went from three people in the back to four people in the front to one person each place. Um, trying to keep everybody on board by staffing them once a day. A bar, a coffee shop, and a retail store, each with their own unique challenges. But one sentiment is universal. If things don't change for the better soon, they're not sure how much longer they can last. Reporting in Chinatown, I'm Casey Lund for This Is Now. Dozens of people spent their Labor Day holiday protesting at Honolulu Hale, calling on elected officials to lift Oahu's stay-at-home order. We not tyranny. They say the rules are inconsistent and unfair. Business owners at risk of going under say the order isn't even logical. Following rules for six months that have no rhyme or reason makes a lot of small business operators and their employees angry. Not frustrated, but angry. Now there are many beaches across Oahu where cops just don't have the time or resources to check for park closure violators. But as Mahalani Richardson shows us, often there are concerned citizens on the lookout. The images and drone video were initially shared on his own Instagram, and that angered the North Shore community. It's a cove at Waimea Bay that North Shore neighbors say has become a magnet for parties during the lockdown because it's hidden from view. On Saturday afternoon, Wes Anderson, who's lived in Hawaii for six weeks, set up what he called a mojito pop-up and shared this photo with Hawaii News Now. I did not do this to make people angry. I actually did it to make people happier during this time. But his actions angered many, including Hui Ohe'enalu board member Mahina Chillingworth, who believes there's a slew of potential violations, from the ban on gatherings, drinking alcohol on the beach, and unpermitted business activity. I mean, everything that he's doing is illegal, especially right now during the shutdown. And local people are, are home. And he's down at Waimea in the way past the, the Haleiwa side of Waimea, which we um, call toilet bowls. And he set up a, looked like a six foot table, folding table. Um, he had his mojitos, you know, he had the liquor for the mojitos. Anderson told Hawaii News Now he was set up from 4.30 to 7 p.m. and asked for what he called donations on Venmo. He says about two dozen people came by for drinks, but now says he apologizes. I, I am remorseful for what I did, but my intentions were meant for good. What are you what, remorseful what are you for? for? Um, the act of um, serving alcohol on the beach during a um, pandemic. The issue so with that. You're not remorseful for what looked like an illegal gathering on the beach during the middle of a lockdown. Oh, I did not bring that gathering together. People have been going there weeks and weeks and weeks in a row. Now, Anderson says he's been the target of death threats and he promises he will not hold the mojito pop up on the beach at Waimea again. But he does say. People need to make money. In Australia, a family is grieving the loss of their loved one after a shark attack. Officials say the man was surfing at Green Mount Beach in Kualangata when the shark bit into his leg. Onlookers rushed to pull the 46-year-old out of the water and emergency services were at the scene to treat him, but unfortunately, they weren't able to save his life. The beach and nearby beaches in the area are closed. Australia's Gold Coast hasn't seen a shark attack since 2012. The battle against COVID-19 still rages around the globe. Some countries were successful in lowering the number of cases only to see the virus resurge. Ian Lee tells us where the virus is making a comeback. It's back to school for kids in Spain. Supplies this year include masks as teachers greet students with temperature checks. 
But while children returned to class, the country became the first in Europe to surpass half a million coronavirus cases. Despite having imposed a strict lockdown, Europe is seeing COVID come roaring back. France hit its highest daily cases ever, with their death toll reaching more than 30,000. Some airlines are now cutting capacity because quarantine measures are unpredictable. While here in the UK, the country recorded nearly 3,000 cases on Monday, the most since May. Russia continues to push forward with its vaccine after claiming victory weeks ago. The drug got a shot in the arm after the UK's prestigious Lancet Medical Journal published a report showing patients developed antibodies with no serious side effects. As scientists get closer to a working vaccine, the World Health Organization warns this outbreak should serve as a lesson. This will not be the last pandemic. History teaches us that outbreaks and pandemics are a fact of life. But when the next pandemic comes, the world must be ready, more ready than it was this time. And with numbers once again rising in some places, many fear we haven't learned the lessons of this pandemic. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. Developing news now, a series of devastating wildfires in the West are turning towns into ruins. Chris Martinez has the very latest developments from California. The California National Guard is working to rescue people and pets trapped by the raging creek fire near Fresno. Military pilots made several attempts yesterday, but heavy smoke stopped them at every turn. The blaze has consumed more than 135,000 acres and is 0% contained. Flames raced through the mountain town of Big Creek, destroying at least half its buildings, including Toby Waite's home. Devastation. I don't know how else to put it. It was totally devastating. These are the charred and melted remains of a gas station in Pine Ridge, and more blazes are burning. Since just, uh, well, August 15th, we have had over 900 fires statewide. The Bobcat fire is burning just on the other side of that mountain, and firefighters worry strong winds expected tonight could force the flames into neighborhoods like this one. We don't want that fire to go any further south. That's why a warning was made for everybody in those areas to be prepared, have a plan ready to go. In the Pacific Northwest, approximately 90% of the town of Malden in Washington State is completely gone. That includes the fire station, post office, and city hall. We have power lines down everywhere. We have trees down everywhere. I'd ask anybody in the area just to stay away, let the firefighters work. Fires have scorched more than 2 million acres in California this year. That's already the highest total on record. And peak fire season is only just beginning. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Monrovia, California. We'll have the latest developments from California coming up on our 4 p.m. newscast here on KHNL. Let's take you outside now. It's a gorgeous day out there. Handing it over to Guy Hoggy with a check of your weather. How's it on this Tuesday? We've got typical trade wind weather with fewer showers than normal. If anything, we'll get some overnight and early morning showers for those windward areas, but rainfall totals over the next seven days will be very, very light. Trade winds will hang on today at 10 to 20, get stronger tomorrow through Friday, and then back off for the weekend. And the corner, of course, is going to be the outlier. They'll have light and variable winds today. It's going to be very, very sticky there. For us, we've got textbook trade wind weather. High temperature running around 90 degrees, but luckily the trade winds will help to regulate the humidity levels. Won't feel all that sticky, except, of course, for the corner side. UV index will be at extreme levels at 12, and the sunset is at 640. No weather alerts, although tomorrow you can expect the box jellyfish to start swimming in to some south and southwest shores. Not a whole lot of surf to speak of, a relatively small wave, shoulder high or less, although in the country, look for a building swell by this afternoon, uh, getting a slightly bigger tomorrow, below advisory levels, but still some good fun uh, preseason stuff rolling into north and west shores by tomorrow. So we've got the nice run of beautiful weather. We could use more rain. We're not going to get much more than a few windward and mucus showers for the next few days. Trade winds getting stronger from Wednesday through Friday and then easing up for the weekend. Keep it here on Hawaii News Now. We'll love all your severe weather updates. Thank you, Guy. Well, the cyberspace is buzzing about this. <laughs> Apple is getting ready to unveil its latest devices. And you might think iPhone, but don't. We're talking about 
the sixth generation Apple Watch and the new iPad. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the product launch for those, we believe, will be September 15th. Uh, Apple made the announcement they are unveiling something on September 15th. Everyone's speculating it's the Apple Watch and new iPad. That's because the new latest edition of iPhones is delayed because of pandemic mm -hmm. production problems. Those are not expected to arrive out until October, and Apple will likely hold its separate event to focus on the phones, which I'm super excited about. Me too. I'm due for a new iPhone. Really? All right, let's go iPhone shopping. <laughs> And speaking of new things, Peloton is unveiling a new bike to make it a little easier to lose those pandemic pounds. It's called the Bike Plus and features a large screen, better speakers, and a system that correlates resistance with your teacher's instructions. Now, Peloton is also introducing a new treadmill as well as a new full body workout class that includes the bike and weights. Now, the company says it's also cutting the price of the original Peloton bike by 15%. The new Bike Plus will be available starting Wednesday. I've never used one. Me neither, but yeah. I have a lot of friends who are into yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Super into it. Well, exciting it looks stuff fun. there for them. Yeah. All right, let's turn it over to Michael George now, who's in New Orleans, who has this really cool story about how the city's arts and cultural culture scene is trying to stay alive. New Orleans is a city of music, art, and culture. But since COVID struck, musician and teacher Sharice Harrison Nelson, famous in Mardi Gras circles as Queen Reese, hasn't been able to perform. And she just found out she lost her teaching job. It is a little bit depressing because culture and art feed your soul. New Orleans musicians and artists are in crisis. No one knows when they'll be able to work again. It's going to be a tough year for the city. Our economy is entirely dependent on tourism, uh, which is not happening right now. Devin DeWolf is part of the Mardi Gras parade group, the Crew of Red Beans. Crew members decided they couldn't stand by and watch New Orleans culture disappear. So they started Feed the Second Line. It's an effort to deliver groceries to older and more vulnerable people in the community. I have four risk factors and I'm 62. So I really limit going out there's also a second part to the effort. The group is hiring New Orleans musicians and artists to make the deliveries. They do not have work at all right now, um, and they will not for a while as uh, all music venues are closed here in New Orleans. So far, Feed the Second Line has raised $100,000 and delivered hundreds of meals. In New Orleans, you show love with food, and the message is being heard. Times are gonna get a little tough, but it's gonna be okay. These are people who make our culture, and uh, we're really fortunate to be in a position to, to help out with that. Making sure when New Orleans comes back, it will look and sound the way it always has. Michael George, CBS News. Some more good news. This is pretty cool. The Jelly Belly founder is pulling off a Willy Wonka style treasure hunt. Ahead of his retirement, David Klein is launching a golden ticket contest where cool. one lucky winner gets their very own candy factory. Now the gold tickets are in the form of necklaces with a verification code on them and they are hidden in secret locations across the US. Klein, who no longer owns Jelly Belly, says he is giving away a candy man's kitchen in Florida to one grand prize winner and other winners will get five thousand dollars it costs about 50 bucks to receive the riddle to play i want that so bad we should I, buy it and just try and figure I, it out oh seriously <laughs> I, well just the I idea love riddles. of yeah right uh -huh. i love jelly bellies but that's just me <laughs> all right guys we're going to end it there today on this is now remember those press conferences coming up this afternoon look for those digital push alerts from the h and app